This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, we are going to be celebrating the legacy and life of producer George Leto. Yes, he's... he's uh, produced some of my favorite Brian De Palma movies like Dress to Kill, Blowout, and Obsession. He's worked with Robert Altman. He's worked with so many, and he's got a terrific story that I'm going to have told to me by his lovely daughter, Andrea Leto, on the phone with me. How do you do, Andrea? Hi, Gilbert. I'm just fine, but call me Andrea, if you will. <laughs> oh, Andrea. I, I apologize. Andrea. It's It looked like it, Andrea, but it had the, it is the A-N-D-R-I-A. I in it. R-I-A. It's an old, archaic, Greco-Roman okay. name, which means um, in the Greco-Roman myth, the original man and woman, they believed, were from Andros, Greece, and the woman was named Andrea, Andrea, and the man was named Andrea. And oh, I so like that. that's like the original Adam and Eve myth that the Bible co-opted. And so my father named me after the original woman. Okay. Andrea, I like that. So, you know, um, my father, well, first of all, my father was born the first, a first-generation Sicilian. Okay. In South Philadelphia in 1930. He was the seventh of eight children, the lucky seventh son. Okay. He had three brothers and three sisters ahead of him, and one sister that was younger than he was. Um, He started playing the saxophone when he was a kid and and, uh, clarinet, Mm -hmm. and he started arranging songs and learning how to arrange music and compose music. And he even was so dedicated to it that he skipped his entire sophomore year of high school only to have to repeat it in a now a Jesuit school when his mother and father found out. <laughs> <laughs> and went on to Temple University and got a, a Bachelor's of Science in Business. Um, he came from a very unusual family. My grandmother and grandfather were very unconventional for the time. They were not very religious. Mm-hmm. They were not racist. In fact, my grandmother famously rescued um, a black man from being beat up by the mafia in front of her store, and she was about five foot two. Wow. Um, my grandfather didn't pay protection money to the mafia. He chased them out of his store because I think they knew he was an elite soldier from Italy called the Bersagliere, which are the king's honor guard, but they're trained like army rangers or green berets. And I think they knew that he would probably be able to assassinate all of them in their sleep. So they let him go. Probably a good call. (laughs) So he grew up in a family that had a lot of courage to stand up Mm -hmm. and to to be a little bit different, to do what they believed was correct, not was not what was people wanted them to do, but what they believed was correct. Because people don't always want you to do what is correct. They were not people who followed uh, like sheep. They they did. My grandfather just owning his own business was it was unusual. So um, he wanted to go into the music business, and he was a jazz saxophone player, and he even wrote a song that Louis Armstrong recorded in 1955 called, <clears throat> spelled M-M-M-M, and it's on the Decca collection. Okay. And he thought he was going to be a, a jazz composer and arranger, but when he realized that jazz was falling out of favor in the 50s and rock and roll was coming into favor, and as he jokingly said, all the jazz clubs he played in returning into strip clubs, he decided he better get a job uh, and stop this idea that he was going to be a musician. So he met an old friend at a concert one night, and he was telling him what he was thinking. And the friend said, well, would would you like to work for William Morris? And my father said, how the heck am I going to go to work for William Morris? And it turned out this kid that he played music with, that he played jazz with, was the son of one of the largest shareholders of CBS. And that Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra had gotten married at his house on the main line in Philadelphia. And so this kid asked his father to give my dad a hand 
and get him an interview at William Morris. And after a series of interviews, he got the job in the mailroom. And he made $35 a week in New York City. He said he lived in a roach-infested apartment near Times Square for $7 a week. And it usually took about three years to get out of the mailroom, but he managed to get out in nine months. Wow. Because my dad never liked letting the grass grow under his feet. In fact, he tells the story of how a, a position opened up as an assistant agent booking Summerstock Theater. And he waited in the stairwell for the agent that would have hired this assistant uh, to come down the stairwell for lunch one day. And he cornered him in the stairwell and asked him for the job. And the guy said, do you know how to do it? And he said, yeah. I mean, he sort of knew how to do it. He'd already been booking his bands when he was a jazz musician. He, he knew some. He didn't know everything, but he figured he'd figure it out as he went. He was ready to sink or swim. So they gave him the job, and his first client was Mae West. Oh, wow. And they told him, take a pad and pencil and go to her hotel room and call her Aunt May. And so Aunt May uh, <laughs> really <laughs> taught my dad something interesting. My dad was used to having women be in charge in his household because his mother was an equal partner with his father, which, again, was very unusual for a Sicilian family of that era. My grandmother had her own money. She contributed to the business. She was actually the one who sold all the wedding cakes, and she did all the sales. She was kind of the original agent in the family. And then um, his three sisters, when the boys were off to war, they all ran the bakery until the boys came back. So my father was only 10 when the war broke out. So he was quite used to seeing women be in charge. So when he walked into Aunt May's hotel room and she said, Georgie, come over here and sit on the bed. <laughs> he trembled a little bit, wondering what was about to happen. But then she went on and said, can I show a pad and pencil? And she told him exactly what she wanted, what kind of deal she wanted him to make, what actors she wanted to see, on what days she wanted to see them. She had it all down. And my father dutifully took it all down and then executed it. And when they, uh, the show opened, it was come on up and ring twice. Uh, after opening night, she told him to shoo all the, the uh, journalists away. And she had her feet in hot water. And she said to him, Georgie, come on over here. And she slipped $1,000 into his pocket. Wow. Says, I know they don't pay you very much over there. But you did a good job. And thus, Aunt May fast became one of my dad's favorite people. Yep. Um, he always respected how she was such an astute businesswoman. And I tell this story because I'm his daughter. Mm -hmm. And he raised me to believe that I could do anything. I was never once told ever that I couldn't do something because I was a woman. I was never told that I was not allowed to succeed in any of my chosen fields because I was a woman. He encouraged me to be and do anything I wanted to be, including to pitch hardball baseball for Little League because I didn't want to play softball with the girls. So he taught me how to pitch. So this informed me as to how my father looked at his whole world. He had a family that believed in doing the right thing, that had a lot of courage, that, you know, encouraged him to do whatever it is he thought he should do with his life. My, my grandfather was always say, well, just try it. You don't know until you try. And uh, so when he got to William Morris, he was a successful, he became a successful young agent. But um, in 1961, he moved out to California and he started working for the Dan Hollywood Agency and then another boutique agency called the Schifrin Highland Agency. And soon it became, within a couple of years, the Schifrin Lido Agency. And then by 1966, close to 1967, my dad left and opened the George Lido Agency. And some of his first clients 
were blacklisted writers. Yes. He represented, his first client was actually Waldo Salt, a.k.a. Mel Davenport. Mm -hmm. And with Mel uh, Mel Davenport, uh, Waldo Salt, he then also got Ring Lardner Jr., who was one of the original Hollywood Ten. Um, Waldo was one of the unfriendly 19. Abraham Polanski, who was one of the unfriendly 19. Paul Jericho. Michael Wilson. Ian Hunter. Joe Losey. And the last one was Dalton Trumbo. Yes. And he came after he had already done Spartacus and had broken through the blacklist. Waldo was already working under his own name, but on crap pictures. And he was really in trouble when he met my father. And he was still calling himself Null Davenport, except in, you know, a few circles. So um, my father went to rather extreme lengths to get him Midnight Cowboy. And then he went to rather extreme lengths to get Michael Wilson, Planet of the Apes. Mm Mm-hmm. And because um, Otto Preminger had already done Spartacus with Dalton Trumbo and Kirk Douglas, it wasn't too terribly difficult to get Ring Lardner the job to adapt the book, MASH, into the film for Ingo Preminger. Um, my, fa- my godfather was Abraham Polanski. Uh, my parents lied to the priest <laughs> and... <laughs> said he was Polish Catholic, Abe was Russian Jewish, so he could be my Catholic godfather in a Catholic baptism ceremony. Um, That's how unconventional my family was. I think they were more concerned that I had a a person in my life that I could respect than worry about what religion he practiced. And from there... uh, because he was so forward-thinking and not afraid, it brought other rather avant-garde clients to him, like he put up the finishing money for Melvin Van Peebles' Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song and helped him sell the film to Cinemation, the distributor. Um, he represented his client Arnold Pearl, co-wrote uh, one script with Ossie Davis and Malcolm X with James Baldwin, and he represented those scripts. It was not exactly popular for a white man in the late 60s to be representing a script about Malcolm X, Mm -hmm. to be sure, nor was it popular for him to be putting up the finishing money for Sweet Sweetbacks, which many people considered to be a very anti-white movie. Um, My father clearly did not. He actually said in print when asked why he did it, he said, well, we've been wrong for 200 years. They're entitled to two hours. Yeah. So from there, that brought him the crazy, inimitable Robert Altman, who had recently been fired from Craft Theater Television. There's a television show called Craft Theater. And Altman famously said in the press that Craft Theater is as bland as its cheese, and surprise, Mm -hmm. surprise, got fired. So uh, another producer friend of my father uh, asked if he would meet Robert Altman, and they went and had lunch. And Bob sat down and rather aggressively said, Mr. Lito, there's one thing you've got to get straight if you want to represent me. I will never do television. And my father said, don't worry about it, Bob. No one will ever hire you again. (laughs) And... My father had a very funny sense of humor. He wasn't going to get upset about this sort of thing. And um, Bob Altman kind of giggled because yes, I think he realized the sort of arrogance of his statement. And um, he took on Altman, knowing he was a bit of a problem child. He was a, he was a handful to handle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but after 17 directors turned down MASH, he managed to get Ingo Preminger to look at two home movies that Robert Altman had directed. He was always filming movies at his parties, and he was a great still photographer. In fact, he took the stills of my parents at their wedding. 
mm-hmm. which are beautiful Kodak ectochrome photos. So these two movies, one was called The Party. Okay. Oh, yes, with Peter Sellers? And the Sellers? other one was called Pot au Feu. Okay. And it, it was produced by Georges, spelled G-E-O-R-G-E-S, Georges Lito. Okay. <laughs> L, L, I think it was L I. T E A U <laughs> or something like that, <laughs> and um, and in in this movie, this Pato Fu kind of became like a little cult classic amongst the Hollywood studio elite, and they were passing around the film all over the place. So Ingo finally got his hands on it, and after seeing those two short films, he hired Bob Al- Bob Altman. You know, I want to uh, just add something here about Mash. Um, you know, did you know it was the first movie? And I heard this, I think, from Roger Ebert. I think they the, used the word "f." The, the f, f word. word. The first That's time. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> My father actually, in seeing, you know, run of the film, mm-hmm. saw it, and he said, "Bob, how are you going to get that in with the censors?" He's like, "Don't worry about it. I get it in." <laughs> and he somehow, because he did it so fast, the censors missed it. Wow. So, um, because, yeah, it was the first (laughs) F-bomb in a film. (laughs) And uh, and when they screened the film for Fox, they didn't like it. They gave him, like, three pages of notes. But my father convinced them that they should show it in San Francisco before they made Bob recut it. And they did a test screening in San Francisco. And in the first few minutes, a few people walked out, and George thought, oh, man, we're sunk. But by the time... By the first 15 minutes of the film, the pe- people in the audience were on their feet and applauding, you know, when they stole the Jeep and everything. They were applauding and, and hooting and hollering. And Dick Zanuck, he was sitting behind my father and Bob Alton. He leans forward and he said, forget about my notes. Don't change a thing. <laughs> my father always taught me when studios give you notes as a writer, <laughs> he said, just remember, they're developing 300 product- projects at once. They probably don't remember what they told you. Don't freak out when you go to a a script meeting because they sometimes have to give you notes to feel like they're doing their job. And I never forgot that because a lot of times their notes are somewhat ridiculous because they are doing 300 scripts at once and and they don't have the same commitment to your project that that hopefully the producer and the writer and the director have when they are, you know, completely committed to it. Mm-hmm. Um, studios are, are have other priorities. And even in those days, they were better about it than they are today. But um, even in those days, they their judgment wasn't always as sound as they liked to believe. So after that, um, somewhere along the way, George met Brian De Palma. Um, my father used to have these standing parties at his house about once a month on a Saturday, he'd have a party mm-hmm. and all kinds of people would drop by. Marty Scorsese would drop by when he was, you know, young guy, um, uh, Lucas Spielberg, all those guys, they all would, uh, had popped by at one time or another Coppola. Um, I remember meeting Marty Scorsese many years later in my twenties. And uh, his producer, Barbara Defina, who is such a sweet woman and a very, very sharp cookie, she went and got him. And uh, he came down the hall, and I have big green eyes. <laughs> and he got, walked in, he's like, oh, I remember you. I remember you. You were a little baby. You did those big green eyes. I, I remember those eyes. And I just started <laughs> to laugh. <laughs> because, you know. <laughs> and he said, I remember. I, I, I took you once, and I bounced you on my knee. And I said, well, uh, Marty, you can't do that anymore. And he goes, ooh, that's funny. That's very funny. That's very good. (laughs) 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 But, yeah, they they all used to come by. I was an an infant. I was a child most of the time. And I think Brian uh, came by uh, because Ed Pressman introduced him to my father because uh, Ed needed help selling sisters. I love sisters. So my father sold sisters. Uh, to distribution, and that's how he met Brian De Palma. And Brian brought him a script for Obsession. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mr. Lito, I want you to be my agent. And my father said, well, I'm only going to be an agent for another year. I'm closing my doors. 
I'm I'm going to cease being an agent and I've decided to become a producer. He had already financed Robert Altman's film That Cold Day in the Park at that point and was going to produce and had raised the financing for Thieves Like Us. And the next one was McCabe and Mrs. Miller he helped put together. Mm -hmm. Um, But he didn't take a credit on that one. He just packaged it. Why didn't he take Uh, a credit on that? uh, You know, sometimes it's just a negotiation. It just, the situation didn't bear it. Okay. You know, you have to be in the room at the time to understand sometimes. Okay. Um, Believe me, I, I think my father... When he was transitioning, I think he was probably still an agent, and when he's still an as a still an agent, he wasn't technically allowed to produce. Okay. So there may have been that situation. I don't know. Okay. I don't remember all. I don't remember every detail, and I think at that time, Miss McCabe and Mrs. Miller came out in '74 or '5. Is that correct? Somewhere so, in there. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I was born in '71, so you're gonna have to forgive me if I'm a little <laughs> fuzzy on details. Well, I just 10. point out the fact that it was a pretty big <laughs> hit. That's why. Oh, you know, yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, you don't know it's going to be a hit when you're making it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just do the best you can. But um, Bob Altman and, and De Palma not only were his clients, but they also, he then went on to produce movies with them. So Brian De Palma said, I'd rather you be my agent for one year than have someone else. So... Uh, he brought him a script for Obsession, and my father said, "You know, Brian, are you are you are you trying to tempt me? Because it, it, this movie takes place in Italy." Now, my father, if you knew my father, you'd know that he loved being Italian. He was very proud of his Italian heritage. He absolutely would not change his name, even though he was the only person in William Morris who was not Jewish and there were uh, maybe there was one other Italian that worked in the Chicago office named Fantosi Tony Fantosi and uh, so at that time it was also not very popular to be Italian I don't think people realize because we have Armani and you know Italian fashion and all this wonderful stuff but you know Italians when they came to this country in the turn of the century were demeaned and maligned and in the south they called them in the south of you know like louisiana mississippi alabama they referred to southern italians especially because they were quite dark as half n-words um there's a famous case about in 1898 in new orleans how a lynch mob lynched about a dozen italians and we almost went to war with italy over it um for a, a woman who made a false accusation of gang rape, that she was it, she was put up to do it, and it turned into this big hullabaloo. And then Italy was on the wrong side of World War II and Mussolini, and so Italians once again fell out of favor and were not very well liked in the 50s and 60s. It really isn't until the mid 80s when the Olympics came to Los Angeles. And uh, Marty Scorsese put all of his guys in Armani suits <laughs> in <laughs> Goodfellas. That uh, it, Italian culture and fashion and being Italian was no longer seen as this low class Southern Italian, you know, goomba mafia thing. And it was, it had suddenly morphed into elegance and. A, a culture that had, you know, great cuisine and great fashion and great furniture and great shoes. So being Italian, even I remember, you know, being a child in the 70s, the kids made fun of me because I had full lips. I'm now laughing hysterically that all these same women are getting collagen injections, but <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, that's what, that's part of what, um, being Italian was it was not the easiest culture. It was, it, it, I mean, it was a bit like being Mexican today. Mm-hmm. We were not a well liked immigrant class. So my father was always enormously proud of his culture, regardless. And he said, "Ryan, are you kidding me? You just sent me a script that takes place in Florence, Italy. Are you are you trying to tempt me to finance this movie?" <laughs> 
And Brian said, I didn't know that, because Brian, of course, was Italian, too. And also from Philadelphia. <laughs> so um, my father took a mortgage on the house. He put his house up wow. to produce Obsession. He financed Obsession with his house. And this was the same year De Palma did Carrie, 1976. Both those movies came out. So. Well, he did Carrie first. Mm-hmm. He had made Carrie, but it didn't come out till later. Okay. Because studios, sometimes they delay their distribution. You know, they, they, they have slots they put things in. Okay. Um, so my father made Obsession, and they made it on their own without any studio participation. And they sold it to Columbia Pictures, which is now Sony. And it was going to open at the Coronet Theater in New York, which is, a, you know, in the old days of the one-run movie houses, it was like the Tony Theater to, uh, to open in. And my father went out to see on the opening night, you know, what the crowd was. And there was a line around the block. Ah, oh, nice. And my father asked one of the people in line, Who, wh- what's this line for? And they said, oh, for obsession. And my father knew. He told my mother, he said, don't you worry. Our house is safe. <laughs> 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 and I'm still collecting money on obsession because we still own all the foreign rights. And I sell it around the world with a sales agent in London. Mm-hmm. And um, the U.S. and Canadian rights are sold by Columbia, Sony Pictures. And they just released uh, a new a DVD, and it's on um, Blu-ray, and it's also on Amazon. Um, so it's available, but it's also sold all over the world. I just made a deal in Germany. I made a deal a couple years ago for a six-month run on German and French television that was a, I couldn't believe how much money they paid me. I was <laughs> quite <laughs> shocked, actually, for a movie that's over 40 years old. Yep. So it's considered a classic. In France, they love it. They show it occasionally at the Louvre when they do a retrospective of De Palma films. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really critically acclaimed, and, of course, it has a score by Bernard Herrmann. It was his last score. Uh and what, was also, Taxi Driver his last year? No, so Taxi Driver came out afterwards, but he, uh, I mean, came out after uh, Obsession, but he actually scored Obsession last. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Bernard Her- Her- Herman uh, also worked a lot with Hitchcock, and of course, uh, um, Brian De Palma was very influenced by Hitchcock. You could see references to Vertigo in uh, yes. Obsession, yes. Correct. Yep. And um, Bernard Herrmann is actually responsible for the ending being changed because Brian's original ending is that he, she was a catatonic in a nunnery. Okay. <laughs> and George kept saying, Brian, I love the script, but you've got to change the ending. And he and Paul Schrader fought George over and over. And to this day, Paul Schrader remains angry about it, I understand. That's what I'm told. Okay. Uh, I haven't met him, nor have I spoken to him, but uh, I've heard from other people that have interviewed him that he's still upset about it. I mean, get over it. It's 40 years later, and a movie was a hit. You mm-hmm. know, take your lumps. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, Bernard Herman sat down with, jo- with Brian and George, and they talked about the score, and he said, you know, one thing, Brian, you got to change that ending. And, you know, Brian was so enamored with Bernie Herman that he did. And I enjoyed the movie as well, yes. It's one of my favorites. It's, I mean, I, I listen, I'm <laughs> highly biased, but <laughs> um, I really am proud of Obsession and Over the Edge, which is directed by Jonathan Kaplan, and Dress to Kill and Blowout. Yeah. I think they are four classic films that have stood the test of time. I mean, Blowout is Tarantino's favorite film. And let's be honest. Dress to Kill is the first movie that stars, I mean, it is openly discussed, a, 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 a transgender character. Dress to Kill is my favorite De Palma movie. I love that film. 
It Love really that. is. I, you know, I wasn't allowed to see any of those films as a child when they came out. <laughs> so <laughs> they, were, they were considered a little too violent for me. Um, but when I was old enough to finally see them, I remember, uh, you know, because I was able to watch some of them be shot. So I was on set as a child. And, you know, I would have been maybe eight or nine when uh, Dress to Kill and Blowout were being shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was on set, you know, for some of the milder stuff. It was a real thrill for me to be able to sit down and actually see one of my father's films because quite literally I was not allowed to see any of them until I was, you know, in my mid to late teens. So I knew my father did these great movies. I just wasn't allowed to see them. Yeah. And um, I have to admit that for years I got into an elevator with a little bit of trepidation after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it definitely is like everybody who saw Jaws got, you know, was afraid of the water after that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have elevator fear. <laughs> and again, another great reference to Hitchcock only instead of the shower it's the elevator but hit but you know and a lot of people have accused Brian De Palma of ripping off Hitchcock but even Alfred Hitchcock's granddaughter had said that uh, she loves what De Palma did he borrowed ideas from Hitchcock but boy he made he threw other things into it like with well, he uh, made it his own and yeah and it's the sincerest form of flattery said Mark Twain yep and I, I try not to argue with Mark Twain yeah, because like uh, Dressed to Kill brought in the transvestite thing, and and Sisters brought in you know reference Rear Window, but it also brought in the whole uh, Siamese twins and and uh, stuff like that. I and, you know Phantom of the Paradise and and the bunch like uh, De Palma was really good at that. So I always think that he had some ideas from Hitchcock, but boy, did he incorporate his own body double, everything, you know, I, I loved his thrillers the best. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that was Brian at his heyday, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, I may be highly biased. <laughs> um, you know, George and Brian fell out, uh, over after when he did Scarface because, uh, you know, in the eighties, I'll just say that a lot of people got into cocaine. Yeah. And my dad, though he drank, um, he, did, he had a two martini lunch sometimes and, you know, a couple glasses of wine at dinner and a cognac and a double espresso mm-hmm. in, his, in his younger days. And he smoked and up until he was 50 years old. So up until 1980, he smoked two packs of unfiltered a day. Okay. Um, much to my sister's and my chagrin. He did not do any drugs. He didn't smoke weed. He didn't do coke. In fact, I remember as a teenager, I was about 12 or 13, my dad sat me down and he said, listen, I don't mind if you have a glass of wine at dinner with us. You can even go to the fridge and, you know, have, share a beer with me if you want, you know, to have some beer with me on the weekend when we watch, because we would ball, watch ball games together. Mm-hmm. He, he said, but, you know, I want you to learn how to drink responsibly. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I just don't want you to do any drugs, and I'll tell you why. I watch too many people ruin their lives Mm -hmm. with drugs because you don't know if you have an addictive personality and you're going to get addicted until it's too late. So I'm just telling you that I don't want you to do it, not because I want to tell you what to do. I'm telling you that because I don't want you to ruin your life. And because he phrased it that way, I just sort of said, okay. And that was it. I loved how your dad handled you and your sister. I think that is fantastic. I love this. And my sister and I, as a result, were probably the two, the only two Hollywood brats in all of Los Angeles <laughs> who didn't do any drugs. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind? If, do you mind if I ask? Uh, and, and if you don't want to answer this, this is fine. But what the fallout was between De Palma and uh, and uh, Brian? Um, you, you mentioned the cocaine thing, like. Like that was, I know Scarface came out uh, through Howard Hawks back in 1932, and it was a major mm-hmm. controversy then. And then De Palma. I'm just going to say that too many people, because I don't want to name names. Sure. Too many people on Scarface were sampling the product and and doing some method acting. Not Pacino for sure, because mm-hmm. he was he was absolutely, um, you know, clean and not he wasn't even 
drinking, I don't think, back then. Okay. Um, but he was, you know, Patino had, uh, you know, sworn off any anything that was self-destructive at that point. But too many people involved in that movie were sampling the product a little too much, and it made my father deeply uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. He had two daughters, two small girls at home, and when people would call on drug fuel binges mm-hmm. at bizarre hours of the night and wake up his wife and daughters, I think he decided it just wasn't worth it to him. I, th- I think I, you know what, I appreciate that. So I remember him telling me, too, about that. And I, it, it made a, an indelible mark on me so that when we had that discussion about drugs, you know, I had seen many of the blacklisted writers, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the house, like Waldo, smoked a lot of pot. And my, my father was not, you know, he, okay, you want to smoke pot, that's fine go do it in the special room away from my wife and daughters. But, you know, we we knew what was up. Um, I think I had seen a lot of people by the time I was a teenager because I was around him in Hollywood and I would come visit him in his office a lot. And I I was really a daddy's girl. I mean, (laughs) I was a daddy's girl from the moment I was born until the day he died. And and I proudly wear that, you know, badge of honor. And... um, I noticed a lot of people, particularly in the 80s, were high a lot and acting like idiots. And I think it it made an indelible mark on me, and I just decided I didn't want to be like those people because, to me, they looked ridiculous. And I think because my father didn't forbid me, he just said, I don't want you to ruin your life. I don't want you to, you know, so many people I have seen have self-destructed, because they couldn't control their addictions, it made me not want to partake. Um, And I was often called a goody two-shoes and, you know, shunned from social events or groups of friends and things. But I very proudly went away because I thought, well, I'm not dumb like they are. (laughs) You turned out (laughs) really well. Like, I really like how your dad brought you up like um i don't hear this all the time and uh i could tell just uh, by your passion that i think you you went on the right path i think he gave you some really great advice yeah he did i mean i i can't say that i was perfect i made a lot of mistakes i made a lot of dumb mistakes um i mean everybody does Mm -hmm. but we are we are to some I'm just going to use some of his expressions. We have some of our experiences, and no experience is lost if you learn from it. That's something else he used to say from, to me. Mm-hmm. So no matter what you do and what, whatever happens in life, no experience is a lost experience if you learn something from it and allow yourself to somehow go forward and be better as a result of it. Okay. And he also used to say that, you know, Life is not a straight line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and success, in order to be successful, you have to be both perseverant. He used to call it stick-to-itiveness. That was his made-up word. And lucky. He said, you know, you have to be lucky, too. And sometimes you just have to persevere until you get lucky. You just got to stick to it. And I did take that away from him, too, I think my sister, she was younger, and I, I think I was more of the daddy's girl, so I, I got more of these sort of life lessons all the time than she did. I think it's something she kind of caught on to later in life. I, I caught on to it pretty young. Mm-hmm. But we both have it. And, you know, to know me in business and, and to do business with me is to know I'm as tenacious as a tiger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when I decide to do something... <laughs> Just get out of the way. (laughs) You know, I am very much his daughter in that way, but I try to do it with a certain amount of charm, uh, as he did. But, you know, he came from a different era, and and he was a different guy. Uh, He was rather famous for being a tough guy and and having a bit of a temper. Um, I realized very early on as a woman I couldn't get away with that. Uh, So I had to learn to be more charming and hold my tongue a little bit. 
Mm-hmm. But every once in a while, a studio executive got a choice word from me, and my dad would laugh hysterically. <laughs> he just, he, he loved it. He never chastised me for, for standing up for myself, as long as I didn't do it in a way that was inappropriate or wasn't measured considering what, what was going on. You know, if I, as long as I wasn't totally extreme, he, he never really chastised me for standing up for myself. And I always appreciated that because I grew up, I have an enormous amount of self-confidence that I wish, I wish I could line up all the fathers in the world and, and give them some lessons from George Leto about how he gave me self-confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it didn't come overnight. Of course, I had plenty of moments of doubt and insecurity, especially in my early 20s, because that's what being in your 20s is about. Mm-hmm. But um, my dad always told me to believe in myself. He used to say, believe in yourself and believe in your own ability to make your own proposition good. Yep. And, you know, I took that with me. I, I do it now. I take it with me every day. Mm, some of the movies that he made... He really was putting his money where his mouth was. I mean, Obsession had a theme of incest. Mm -hmm. Dress to Kill had a transgender lead character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we're not saying these are definitely not movies that were considered conventional or even acceptable necessarily in in 19, the late 70s and early 80s. You have to realize that it sounds like, oh, it's not a big deal now, but... Back then, that was crazy, you know? Yeah. You, you had mentioned that you was on the set of some of these films. Do you, oh, have yeah. any, you have any stories of any of these movies that you was on the set of? Do I have any stories? Um, let's see. Well, I was on the set. I remember being on the set of Blowout. Okay. And, of course... John Travolta was like the thing, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I was about nine years old. And Travolta, I have to admit, was always very sweet, you know? I've heard that about him by several people. Yes, he, and yeah. he was always sweet to me. I mean, I've run into him uh, in various events over the years, and I introduced myself as Andrea Lito, George's daughter. And he is always very gracious. Oh, hi, how are you? How is your father? Please tell him I say hello. Mm-hmm. I mean... A lot of people in Hollywood, even if it's just, you know, saccharine gratitude or saccharine graciousness, they don't even do that. And and he's always been incredibly gracious. And I, I think for John it comes naturally. Yeah. I think it comes naturally because I think he's basically a really decent person. Yes, yes. Um, nobody's perfect, as I would as I would always say about everybody, mm-hmm. but he, I think deep down he's basically a very decent person. Well, John Travolta, according to Autograph Collector magazine, was always one of the top ten most approachable celebrities for fans. I've heard yeah, so many I great mean, things. I remember as a nine-year-old being yeah. on the set, and he was very sweet to me, and I remember being so elated that I could go to school yeah. <laughs> the following Monday and say, I got to meet John Travolta. <laughs> 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 because, you know, Grease was huge and yep. Saturday Night Fever was huge. Yep. And, you know, he was a matinee idol and I got to meet him. Yep. Uh, I also remember thinking he was very tall. I'm, I'm a very tiny girl. I'm five foot one and a half. But, you know, as a child, I was even more tiny for my size. I, I was a very late uh, bloomer and I grew very late. So I was even small for my age group, and I remember thinking he was so tall, you know, um, because they always talk about how actors are short, and he was so tall. Also, Nancy Allen. I have remained friendly with Nancy Allen. In fact, I just had lunch with her about a week ago. Uh, Over the years, she's also a very lovely, decent human being. And um, I'm always gratified to see people in the business be both – Gracious and grateful, because mm-hmm. this is not a business where people like to accord credit or gratitude very often. So when I see it, I always feel very lucky to have it, because, um, again, this is 
you know, there's a lot of selfishness in Hollywood, and, and we mm-hmm. hear about it all the time. We read about it. And there's a lot of wonderful people, too. But I always, I, I always consider myself lucky when I get to work with the kind of people or be around the kind of people that, you know, remember who gave them their breaks mm-hmm. and who helped them along the way and, and who stood up for them. And so getting to that, um, I am actually doing a documentary as we speak on my father's participation in standing up for the blacklisted writers that he represented. Yes. Because he represented seven blacklisted writers. Uh, Most of them were members of either the Hollywood 10, Dalton and Ring Lardner. Dalton Trumbo and Ring Lardner were part of the original Hollywood 10. Mm -hmm. The others were members of the infamous Unfriendly 19 or were subpoenaed later after that. Um, And... He, my father risked a lot to stand up for these people. The FBI used to come to the house and interrogate him and ask him, Mr. Lido, are you, are you a communist? And he'd say, no. He'd say, are you aware your clients are writing material that's subversive to the United States government? And I'm going to not use the F-bomb here because I know we're on radio. But, that's uh, okay. You know what? <laughs> I've had I don't several. give an F yeah. what they write. <laughs> when I sell it, I get 10%. And last time I checked, that's called capitalism. Now get the F out of my house. <laughs> Do you know how many, you know how much, like, stones, the stones it took for my father to do that mm-hmm. in the 60s? And people were just coming off the blacklist, I mean, trickling off. The blacklist really wasn't effectively dead until the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And... It took a while. I mean, once Dalton did Spartacus, it wasn't like it was just suddenly over. Yeah. It wasn't over at all. Dalton was still hurting for money. Uh, Waldo Salt was still hurting for money. You know, the other blacklisted writers and, and blacklisted actors and directors and people were still struggling to, to get their careers back. Lee Grant spent 12 years on the blacklist, and she wasn't even a member of the Communist Party. Wow. She had guilt by association because she stood up at a funeral uh, of someone who committed suicide who was blacklisted and had gone before the committee and and said I believe the HUAC hearing I believe the HUAC killed him the House of Un-American Activities Committee they killed him wow. and for saying that she was blacklisted because she was also married to a, a writer who was a member of the Communist Party but she herself wasn't so this is how the country, the mood of the country was the right wing in the United States has always sort of had its moments of resurgence. And you could talk about it. It started with the Salem witch trials. I mean, the Crucible, which is Arthur Miller's play about the Salem witch trials, is really an allegory, a metaphor, if you will, for the Hollywood blacklist. Because it worked exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. People were accused of being witches or communists. They either had to name names of other witches or communists, or they were persecuted. Miller himself was blacklisted. So, and to understand the concept of the time is to understand that when these people were communists, quote unquote, they were, communism had. It was a new idea that had come into favor in the 20s and 30s because in many countries they still had monarchies or they were just coming out of monarchies. And um, in the United States we had this robber baron class and workers had no rights. There, there, was no, there were no child labor laws. There, were no, there was no 40-hour work week law. There was no uh, OSHA and occupational safety hazards uh, laws. There were no unions. None of that came into play until 1938 was the first labor law passed by Congress which stopped children working in factories. There was no Social Security. There was no Medicare. There was no, I mean, we don't have nationalized health care still in the United States while you guys have it up in Canada. So, you know, I applaud you Mm -hmm. because I'm Italian too, and I've seen national health care on a two-tier system work also in in Italy. Um, Again, it's not perfect. No system is, but... You know, people don't end up with $100,000 
medical bills and go bankrupt as a result of being sick in, in your countries. Um, this is what they were fighting for. They were also fighting for civil rights and women's rights and equality. Women had only gotten the right to vote in the United States in 1922. So it wasn't so incredibly radical what they were looking for and what they were trying to accomplish. It's just that perhaps their method of doing it was flawed because once they realized that Lenin and Stalin were murderous bastards, at a certain point they all became disillusioned. Mostly all of them became disillusioned. Some of them held fast to their their altruism. But it's not that they were looking for communist dictators to take over this country. They were looking for a fairer society. And they were a bunch of intellectual elites. And my father believed that they were entitled to work in their chosen profession and receive fair compensation. Yep. Because murderers got out of jail and had that right. There were certainly people down in the South that were lynching people and killing people. They were even killing, they even killed two Jewish college students in the 60s who came down to work for civil rights in the late 50s, early 60s, I can't remember what year, and getting away with it. They, they shot, you know, Emmett Till. They, they shot, I mean, and sorry, it upsets me to just think about it. These people yeah. got away with murder, and they were allowed to go back to work. Yeah. No one blacklisted them. They weren't labeled as subversive by our government. Nope. And it's happening again now, and that's why I'm making this documentary. Freedom of the press is being limited here in this country because we have a president who has decided that he wants to decide what's news and what's fake news. Yep. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We, we have a right wing that is protecting him at all costs, just regardless of its what it's costing us in national security or our standing around the world because they're too afraid to stand up to him. Mm -hmm. We have a left in this country who hasn't quite figured out how to stand up to him. And, you know, we're all complicit with our silence. Yep. And my father taught me by example that you lead by example he didn't do what he did to be a hero. He could have chosen to represent anybody else. There were plenty of talented writers in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But he chose to represent them because I think some part of him, being an Italian and being an outsider himself, he understood what it felt like to not entirely be accepted by society. And also, the Talmud says, where there is a need, be thou the man. Yeah. Well, my father knew what the Talmud said because his mother's uh, good friend that she sewed with was Jewish, and they used to talk about these things. And many of his clients, you know, my godfather, Abram Polanski, was a philosopher in addition to being a writer and a director and a hero in Paris with the uh, OSS. He fought under de Gaulle in World War II and still got blacklisted. Oh, wow. But where there is a need, be thou the man. So I'm hoping that in making this documentary about a man, one man, who mm -hmm. stood up to an entire system and then inspired other people. You know, Kirk Douglas was before him, but this is how you lead, by example. Yes. That maybe more people will do that. More world leaders will stand up. Because the United States led the way on so many things. Maybe it's time for other countries to do the same and lead us back to the country we are supposed to be, the country that our founding fathers created. This documentary, how far into it are you? I'm at the very beginning. Okay. I started shooting my father before he died. My father died April 29th okay. of this year. <laughs> Sorry. It's I still okay. can't say that without getting a little upset. <laughs> Um, he, uh, he passed away in, on April 29th and mm -hmm. before he died, I had focused my time and attention on shooting him and getting him to tell his stories. 
And obviously he was a man in his 80s, so I couldn't, you know, sit him down for hours at a time. So I would get a little time here and a little time there. And I had managed to rack up with a filmmaker friend of mine named Edwin Samuelson. Yes, he's directing a film that I'm an associate producer on right now. Excellent. Yeah. So he and I uh, managed to get my father to sit down for a series of few different interviews and get about four hours of his stories. Nice. On camera. And admittedly, the last interview we got of him was less than a week before he died. So he's quite weak. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know he was dying. He didn't tell me. He didn't tell anyone. He even died the way he lived, on his own terms and honorably. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to upset me or... um, the people who loved him most, my family, his family, his two sisters that remain. Mm -hmm. And um, so he didn't tell us that he, we knew he had a a heart valve that needed replacing at some point. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how dire it was, and we didn't know that he had chosen not to do anything about it. You know what? I think... To leave this world on his own terms and get the death he always wanted. He, he always told me he wanted to just die in his sleep. And that's pretty much what happened. He, his heart just stopped while he was sleeping. I'm going to say one thing. Listening to you, you are doing a wonderful job at carrying on his legacy. And i got to, I got to say you're very well-spoken. You're very well-mannered. Like, and just, yeah, like I am really, I'm impressed with you, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you. You, You're welcome. This is a tribute to him. So, you know. Well, it it is. The tribute to him is that I could be somebody that he would be proud of. And you know what? I really got to say, I have not talked to Ed, Edwin Samuelson, but I know he was doing a live chat on Facebook for the the Hearts of Dark Darkness, the uh, making of the final Friday film that I'm uh, part of. And uh, he was mentioning this, and I was like, I, w- I wanted to talk to somebody that was involved with Dress to Kill. And then I, I he had mentioned that uh, your father had passed away, but he mentioned... You and that put the light bulb in my head to connect with you, and here we are chatting about this. And I find this is one of the most fascinating interviews I've done all year. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, well, he's a fascinating man, so all I have to really do is tell his story. But Mm -hmm. I will say this if you think I'm well spoken and eloquent, I I have him to partially credit in the sense that my father paid for the best education that I could get. Yes. I went to private schools all my life. Mm -hmm. I was a good student, so I made the most of it. Mm -hmm. But he didn't flinch to send me to one of the most expensive high schools in Los Angeles because Mm -hmm. it was one of the best. And he didn't even bat an eyelash when I said I wanted to go to Tulane University in New Orleans, and I got in. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, he also knew I was secretly getting an unofficial minor in jazz and blues on the weekends, but <laughs> I was just like my father. <laughs> you... I had a penchant for good music. I still do. Do you have um, a favorite instrument? Um, my voice. I'm a singer. Okay. Oh, nice. I, I sing. My father wrote a number of songs, and I have recorded a number of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just sang at Michael Feinstein's club here in Los Angeles called Feinstein's at Vitello's. Okay. Uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, I'm a friend of Michael's. Michael and I go back about 20 plus years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Michael doesn't let just anyone sing in his club. So I like to think that I at least achieve a certain caliber, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, is why he lets me sing there. Um, and uh, so I play the piano, but it's not my favorite instrument. I play to accompany myself sometimes and I play a little classical music. But honestly, I love to sing. And. Okay. Um, So in the documentary, you will also get to hear many of George's songs that he composed that have not been released. Um, And uh, my favorite is called Living a Life of Dreams. Ah, nice. And my dad was a dreamer, but he always used to say in order to achieve something, you have to be able to dream it, and then you have to work really hard to execute it. Mm -hmm. One without the other won't do. 
Here's a question I have, you know, going sure. back to Dress to Kill. You know, um, do you remember much about the controversy that film caused? Because I remember Cruising was controversial that year. You know, Friday the 13th and Cannibal Holocaust come out that year and uh, uh, various other films. But Dress to Kill really uh, lit a fire. Maniac was out that year. Uh, a lot of uh, people censoring films and Dress to Kill, of course, come under attack. Do you uh, remember much about that? No, I really would have been too young. I mean, it came out in 79. I would have been seven, eight years old. Because um, I was born in 71, but I'm born in August. So Actually, it came out in 80. <laughs> 80, okay. Yeah. So I would have been eight. Do you Not remember quite, anything? Eight. You... eight or nine, yeah, eight or nine. So, I, I, you know, since I didn't get to see the movie and I didn't really know what was in it, I, I don't think even if I heard about the controversy, I would have understood it. I was wondering but, if you heard anything about how your father addressed this. Um, not really, other than I can only surmise that he shrugged it off mm -hmm. and just stood up for the movie that he made, because that's what he would have done. Yeah. Well, Dress to Kill was a very daring movie, and i got to say, you mentioned Nancy Allen. She's one of my favorite parts of the movie, you know. I, I tried to get her on here, but no success. But I'm going to tell you, she does two things in that movie that just grabbed my attention. Number one, when she's in the subway being heckled by the uh, gangsters, and mm -hmm. um, no, no, it's not in the, the gangsters. When she's being uh, addressed by Dennis Franz, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, I got that mixed up. Dennis Franz, and and um, he goes, "Who are you effing?" And this look on her face as she goes, "F you," I'm like, I'm sorry, it's one of the sexiest things I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she is pretty sexy in that movie. I, I mean, I can, I can see why people fell madly in love with her in Carrie, and then mm -hmm. again in Dress to Kill and Blowout. And another so, thing she did too, I, I love the scene, this just brief moment where she's fleeing in the subway and she's wearing the frilly blue outfit, you know, and mm -hmm. and she grabs hold of the subway terminal thing there and she just leaps over it and. Mm -hmm. I love that. You see guys do it, but she's doing, she does it, you know, and I always well, love that. Anyone who's lived in New York for any amount of time <laughs> has learned how to do that. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say that I've ever actually illegally jumped a subway turnstile. Yeah. But we all know how to do it, shall we say. Well, I love that. Those are two of my favorite parts of the movie, and Nancy well, Allen doing that. She was a game girl. She is a game girl. Mm -hmm. You know, she still runs, she works on a, a cancer charity, and I believe that the next uh, the next event they're doing has is tied into Dress to Kill. I'm not sure when they're going to do it yet, but she was mentioning it to me, and I I hope they manage to get, get it put together. We don't own Dress to Kill anymore, so... That would be up to, I believe it's MGM that uh, has the rights to it, to to allow them to do it. So I hope they are able to do that. Um, I'm saying this out loud because I'm, of course, trying to coerce them into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, there's so many things in Dress to Kill that were so great, you know. Like, um, I love those long, long, long sequences told oh, yeah. just by the music, the museum sequence, the shower well, sequence. It's a beautiful sequence, yes, and that was shot inside the Philadelphia Museum. It's mm -hmm. the Metropolitan Museum on the outside, but they weren't able to shoot inside the Met, so they went to the Philadelphia Museum and shot inside the Philadelphia Museum for that sequence inside the museum. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Pino, Do Pino Donaggio's music. So Pino Donaggio was a pop star in the 60s, who famously wrote this song in English. It's called You Don't Have to Say You Love Me that Dusty Springfield recorded and Elvis mm -hmm. recorded. Mm -hmm. In Italian, it's called Io Che Non Vivo. Okay. And he became an overnight sensation singing that song at the San Remo Festival, which launched his career. And he was about as famous as Neil Diamond was in America, for example. Mm -hmm. So very famous pop star that then transitioned because he was a classical violinist and classical pianist into composing music for mu for movies. And Brian uh, asked him to do Dress to Kill. Mm -hmm. And the music I think he wrote for that sequence is haunting and yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it really does complement 
the cinematography and the daring that uh, it took for De Palma to do that silent sequence. I mean, no dialogue, as we say, MOS sequence. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating moment in movie history because it really proves that, you know, actions do speak louder than words. Mm-hmm. I actually have an autographed picture of Pino DiNaggio. I wrote to him years ago, and um, I loved his uh, music to carry and to dress to kill, and uh, and uh, the movie was just great. And another thing that stands out in that movie, too, is that opening shower scene with Angie Dickinson, mm-hmm. where she's having a rape fantasy. I heard on the radio uh, they were doing the top, sexual fantasies of women and I was shocked to find out and nobody wants to be raped but I was surprised at how many women have that fantasy I know a woman that has that fantasy and there was Angie Dickinson having this well let me put it to you this way um fantasies should remain fantasies and mm-hmm. that's why they're fantasies yeah because and, you know I, I don't know I mean I don't have that fantasy. <laughs> I don't. I don't blame you, and I'm not condoning it. Uh, I may have others. But yeah. <laughs> I don't have that one. Uh, that said, um, I think uh, I don't know that women necessarily want to be raped in no. their fantasy, but they like the idea of succumbing to the seduction. You know, yeah. it was um, interesting of, of a, when I of heard a stranger. That, yeah. Well, I I found that interesting when I heard this because uh, I thought of. Angie Dickinson and Dressed to Kill because when she's coming back to reality, she's having bad sex with her husband, which leads her, of course, to talk to Michael Caine as her therapist. Right. You know, I I just find Dressed to Kill fascinating on so many levels. Well, it was also, in in some ways, really on the pulse. I mean, I'm definitely not going to say that Brian De Palma understands women. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to go there. Probably But I'm going to say this. In that moment, that one portion of the film, Mm -hmm. he seemed to understand something that I don't know if it's from his own experience, from his own family, or from somebody who told him this experience, but he understood something that I think a lot of women were going through at that time, which was, you know, there had been this sexual revolution in the 60s, -hmm. but a lot of housewives in the 70s were still having, frankly, really substandard sex with their husbands. Mm Mm-hmm. And in the inimitable words of one of my father's sisters, who is very polite and doesn't use any curse words, once said to me, sex is for for two people, dear, and if only one person is having an orgasm, the other one might as well go to the gym. Yeah. And (laughs) out of her mouth, it was really quite amusing. Uh, But the idea is that I think he was tapping into something about women's sexuality, maybe Mm -hmm. unknowingly, maybe knowingly, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, that really was speaking to the times that women were finding that they were very frustrated in their marriages because their husbands really weren't that interested in their pleasure. Yeah. And that's something that's over the last 20 to 30 years has really begun to change. And women have uh, taken more control of their own sexuality and, and, I think the whole Me Too movement is an, another form of taking control of mm-hmm. our bodies and our sexuality and demanding a certain amount of respect yep. uh, from society mm-hmm. uh, as a whole. Mm-hmm. I'm not married. I've never been married. So I can't speak for bad marital sex. Well, you know, know what? I... I'm not married either. And you know what? You know what? It, there's nothing wrong with being single, you know? <laughs> mm. No. Nope. But I will say this. I could tell you right now that I would never marry anybody who wasn't worried about my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would just never happen. <laughs> but you know what? George Leto, even as a father, in regards to teaching his daughters about sex, okay. my parents were very, for- my mom too, were very forward thinking about it. Mm-hmm. They really did not say, don't have sex. In fact, we, they basically said to me, and I'm the oldest, mm-hmm. is we prefer you wait. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do it, please come to us 
Let's make sure you have protection and birth control. We don't want you to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to ruin your life. Mm -hmm. And and please, you know, we think it would be better for you if you waited to find somebody you really cared about. Yep. And I think that this style of parenting, they didn't get everything right about parenting, believe me. Mm -hmm. But this particular aspect of telling us what they preferred and what they thought was better for us rather than saying, don't do this and don't do that, Mm -hmm. led my sister and me both to wait quite a long time and to have pretty healthy attitudes about sex. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to teach both your sons and daughters to have very healthy, constructive attitudes. Because, you know, once they leave your house and they fly the coop, you know, then we have to go out in the world and we have to deal with it. Yes, so I am I feel very lucky that I grew up in a household that um where I had a lot of encouragement to mm-hmm. be a strong woman and to be smart and to be uh ambitious and driven. Nobody I mean my mom sometimes would worry about me because I think she saw as a woman that I was pushing boundaries, but my dad never worried about that. He would just sort of say, you know, go out there and do your best. And whatever will be, will be. Que sera, sera. You know, with, uh, you've seen the the Joker movie that's out right now. Did you, uh, yes. Blow out his feature on Marky in the movie. Did you oh, see I that? Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I noticed that, uh, that, uh, you know, I have to admit that, you know, like I said, his movies still live on, you mm-hmm. know? Now, Blow Out and uh, Obsession both have John Lithgow. Now, you said you was uh, visit the set of Blow Out. Did you meet John? I did. Um, I met John and on Blow Out. I did meet him on Obsession because mm-hmm. I was obviously way too young. Mm-hmm. Um, and funny, you know, funny story is they actually auditioned my mother to play Jean-Vivre Bougeot's part because my mm-hmm. mother's Italian and speaks fluent Italian, and she's, my mother is stunning. Okay. <laughs> so um, my father was not stupid. He married a very beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so they auditioned my mother, but my mother was not an actress, and she laughed her, her way through the entire audition. So that, that was the end of that. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, John was discovered on, on Obsession. Brian mm-hmm. brought in John to play the part, and my dad had said no to probably 50 actors. And... Brian was getting so flabbergasted. He said, George, if you don't like this guy, I give up. And he brought in John, and my dad loved him. He said, this is the guy. And Cliff, normally, Cliff Robertson did not like to work with actors that were taller than he was. But he made an exception for John because John was so good. John turned out to be so funny, too, in the later oh. movies. <laughs> Oh yeah, well he is. He's 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 a he, you know he's he's kind of, he's a very affable guy. In fact, mm-hmm. many years later, it's a funny story. Mm-hmm. Um, I take ballet class, and I've been a I worship at the altar of ballet and have for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's how I stay fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say this is about how many years ago? Fifteen years ago, I walked into my ballet class having just come back from Italy, and John Lithgow was in my class. And my teacher is a was a my teacher at the time. She only teaches privates now. Was a very famous ballerina from the Bolshoi Ballet, mm-hmm. named Ala Khanyashvili. And and John had gone to see Ala because he was doing something with the New York City Ballet. And typical of John, he just wanted to understand a little bit more about ballet. So there he was in a t-shirt and tights. I mean, I got I give him credit for trying. This was really great. <laughs> <laughs> and he hears me say that I just got back from Italy, and he very sweetly says, "Oh, you know, I did my when I did my first movie. My first movie was in Italy, not knowing that he was talking to George Lido's daughter." <laughs> and so I kind of baited him a little bit, and I said, "Really?" He said, "Did you like it?" He said, "Oh, I had a great time." I said, "Did they pay you well?" He said, "Oh yeah, I think I've made more money than I'd ever made in my life. It was my first big job," <laughs> and I said. So it was a good experience? He said it was a great experience. I said, I'm so glad to hear that because my name's Andrea Lito. I'm George's daughter. And he threw his head back and laughed. (laughs) (laughs) He said, are you kidding? I said, no. He said, I can't believe it. And the teacher had said, oh, John, just stand behind Andrea and just watch what she does. Do what she does. (laughs) So here he was standing behind me in ballet class following along. It must have blown his mind that he was standing behind the daughter of the guy who gave him his break, you know, (laughs) In Hollywood. 
(laughs) (laughs) It's just, you know, Hollywood's a small place. He was very gracious and very sweet. In fact, I gave him my father's number, and I think he picked up the phone and called him a few days later, and they had a very nice chat. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, John's had a wonderful career, and he, he should. He's a very talented actor and a very nice man. And, and I, I hope I run into him in another class. Who knows? <laughs> how, how is he at ballet? <laughs> Um, well, he, he would n- had never done it before, so <laughs> I think he was just trying to ca- kind of understand, watch and feel what it felt like to move your body a certain way. You know, John is he's not he's not an actor that just wings it. Mm-hmm. It's clear he's a very studious actor. So yeah. he wanted to understand if he was going to be on stage with the New York City Ballet, even if he wasn't going to be dancing. I think he wanted to feel a part of it and understand what it was like, you know, to be around dancers before he walked into City Ballet, for example, which is a bunch of uber professionals. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was honored that, you know, uh, he was standing behind me uh, and, and watching what I was doing. Uh, I still do ballet because <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's good for your body. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a different teacher now because Allah only takes uh, private students and a lot of her students have gone on to, to big companies and I take with another teacher named Hasmika Marion, who also has had students go on to big companies. So, you know, again, that was another thing that I was encouraged to do was be very artistic in my household. Um, you don't have to make a living as a ballerina, but if it's something you enjoy, continue doing it. Do you like? You know? Did you like Black Swan, the movie? You know, it's funny. Uh, my ballet teachers did not because they thought, oh, it's so over the top, and, and but that was sort of the point. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's an it's an allegory. It's it's a, not meant to be a, a true story. It's it is an over the top story mm-hmm. about a, a a ballerina gone mad, mm-hmm. and it could be it could have been about anything. It could have been about a singer that went mad or any kind of artist that goes mad. Because in order to achieve the kind of artistic perfection one has to achieve in order to be a prima ballerina, especially, it 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 takes a certain amount of mental toughness. The ballerinas that make it and become the top-level ballerinas in the world aren't necessarily the ones who had the most natural talent. Some of those people actually don't make it because they don't have the drive, because it's been too easy for them. They never make it. They never get there. The ones who make it are the ones who have what my father called stick They're the ones who push past all the limits and the barriers and the people that say no and the obstacles to get where they get. Because, for example, Maria Kochetkova, who dances for um, San Francisco Ballet and was a Bolshoi uh, principal, Mm -hmm. is now a Bolshoi principal uh, as a guest principal, when she was studying at Bolshoi Ballet, they didn't like her because she was too short. She's only 5 feet 1. They like them usually a little little taller, 5'3", 5'4". And she, they said she had a short neck. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. And so they, they cut her loose. And she persevered, and she went to other companies and persevered, and she became, now she's considered one of the best prima ballerinas in the world mm-hmm. because she didn't give up. Now, um, you mentioned, we, going back to obsession for a second, Genevieve, or, am I going to get her name wrong? Uh, Bougeau. Jean-Vierre Bougeau. Oh, I am going to get that wrong. Loved her in the film, by the way. Yeah, but oh, she's wonderful. Well, she's Canadian, as you know. She's yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we're, we're, we're very proud to have her. But did your mom ever regret not landing that role? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my mom is the antithesis of an actress. <laughs> <laughs> she absolutely has no ability to perform for a crowd. Or, or she's, she's shy. My mom's shy. Okay. My mom is good in polite company and with her friends, but she's my mom is not a performer. <laughs> you know, she did not have that. My father had that. He would love to sit down at the piano and play for all his friends and play the saxophone and 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 I'm like that. You know, I sing and I dance and but my mom didn't have that courage to stand up and and perform in front of other people. Some people just don't it's not their thing. Okay. I think she liked being, you know, um, she liked attention only in private. Okay. There's a few other films I want to ask you about. Um, 
drive-in is one. I've interviewed uh, Gary Cavanero Jr. from that, <laughs> or Senior, wow. excuse me, yeah, Gary Cavanero from the Bad News Bears, and he's in drive-in, and uh, mm-hmm. I see that on here. Any stories about that? Only that, my, you know, it was a little movie that my father, um, you know, helped put together and sell to Columbia as well, and it ended up doing a, a you know, really good business. I mean, it was one of those kind of surprise hits. They were hoping that it would might be a maybe a modest hit, but it was a much bigger movie than they ever expected. It's it, that's always a great thing when you, you put something together and you movies are hard. You put you, literally over a year of work into you know, um, getting a movie produced from beginning from production to putting it in the theater. Never mind all the time you spend before that trying to get it financed and cast and made. And so movies are kind of like giving birth to a, ch- a child in, in, in a metaphorical way. And so when you see this thing that you've invested so much of your time and energy in succeed and, and you didn't really have a whole, whole lot of hope that it was going to be that big, you just kind of hoped it would be a reasonable success mm-hmm. and that it was so well-liked that, that it, it was, I think, my, it was one of the great surprises of my dad's career, you know? Okay. Um, there's some surprises and there's some disappointments sometimes. You know, another great surprise is he sold the Lords of Flatbush okay. to Columbia. He represented the picture. And, you know, that's a movie that was made for what we like to say three nickels and two dimes. Mm-hmm. And he sold it to Columbia, and it ended up being the movie that got, <laughs> that allowed Sylvester Stallone to do Rocky. Oh, wow. Because Sylvester Stallone had been toting the script around for quite some time, trying to make it, but he insisted on being the star, and nobody wanted to let him do it. But when the producers and and the financiers saw Stallone in The Lords of Flatbush, they they let him star in Rocky. Another one I want to bring up. Um, this, of course, made the year before Dress to Kill. Uh, and one other thing, it's also the thing that got Henry Winkler the Fonz. Okay. Okay. So, you know, two amazing careers came out of that little movie. And then there's Over the Edge. Uh, Then that is actually my favorite of all of my father's films. Um, That's just a personal choice. Why is that your favorite? Why is that my favorite? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, first of all, I think it's incredibly ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd like to remake it because I think it's so apropos to today it's about a bunch of suburban kids in a colorado town not too far from aurora colorado Mm -hmm. in greeley colorado that the parents are not paying attention to them they're more interested in their real estate value of the town and money and financial concerns and status and da 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 and these kids are getting lost in the shuffle and being left to their own devices. And this new kid to town is getting hassled and bullied, Michael Kramer. Mm -hmm. And he ends up hanging out with kind of the bad kid, Matt Dillon, who my dad and uh, Jonathan Kaplan discovered, hanging out, playing hooky outside of school uh, in New York. And um, the bad kid who was like from the poor side of the tracks, ends up getting shot by the very overzealous cop named Doberman. And his gun isn't even loaded. And the whole town goes into an uproar. And the kids are so angry because it's already a bit of a a, a powder keg, what's going on, with, and the kids are, are already upset and agitated and feeling neglected and... Uh, harassed by the cops and all the parents and the teachers meet in the school for a big PTA you know town hall meeting and the kids get together and they lock them all in the school and then they riot and they set the school on fire in protest yes and it's a movie about drugs and guns and children being ignored, and politics prevailing over common sense and reason and what's good for the town. 
and money. And I don't think much has changed. I think the only thing that's wrong with Over the Edge is that it was released about 30 years too soon. Because even though that was already happening, people didn't want to acknowledge it was happening back then. But it was a cautionary tale back Mm -hmm. then. Now it's happening. Yes. And the only difference is they're not all white kids. It's a multi-ethnic society. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's one of the most profound films. Because De Palma's films are their interesting and cool and avant-garde and unusual and clever and scary and they grab you emotionally. This film grabs you by the throat Mm -hmm. and shakes you and says, what's the matter with you? And and, uh, it it is. It's a cautionary tale of what was going to happen. So, you know, this movie was shot about 20 minutes from Columbine High School. And the next town over from Aurora, Colorado, where the the movie theater, you know, the the guy shot up kids in the movie theater. Yeah. And and this is not, this movie was trying to to warn people. And sometimes movies are made for that reason. Yeah. And, And we haven't heeded that warning here in America yet. No. And um, I think it should be remade because I I think we need to warn them again. We need to start making people aware of what's happening to our children and the kind of lives they have to lead now in order to grow up. They have to have drills in school, drills, not fire drills, not earthquake drills, not tornado drills. They have to have drills in case somebody comes in with a gun. What kind of life is that? Yeah, I know. It's scary. I've never been to the states, and uh, and I'm actually kind of a little nervous about going there because of everything you're hearing. Well, and I'm I'm going to stand here and say I am not against people owning a personal firearm. And same here, yeah. In the United States, if you have to be licensed to drive a car, and this is my personal opinion, and my father shared it with me, by the way. Yeah. If you have to be licensed to drive a car, and you in in America, in order to buy Sudafed, you have to show your license then you should have to be licensed to own a firearm. I and you agree. should have to have that license renewed periodically. You should have to know how to use that firearm the way you have to know how to use a car. You sh- certain people should be prohib- prohibited entirely from owning them because they are considered a danger to society. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, but I don't think anyone needs to own a military-style weapon. Our Second Amendment does not say you have the right to own cannon or nuclear weapons. So why should you have the right to own an AR-15? Because exactly. it's fun? Because you're going to overthrow the government? I mean, if anyone thinks with an AR-15 they can overthrow the government that has a nuclear arsenal that could blow up the world ten times over, they're deluded. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay, I get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, but I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm totally behind you on that. Yep. I know people that own guns, but they're responsible. But uh, it's, like, it's like Howard Stern says. People say, have guns for hunting. You don't need... Uh, an automatic weapon to go hunting with unless you're taking out the whole rainforest, you know? No, you, you know what it is? If you're a lousy hunter, you need an automatic weapon. But then again, if you're a lousy hunter, should you be allowed to have one? Exactly. True, yeah. True. And You uh, know, in Israel, for example, where mm-hmm. a lot of people have guns because everybody has to join the military, male and female. Okay. You have to be licensed. I believe it's every year. You have to renew or every two years. You have to renew your license. You have to prove that you know how to own and operate and clean and store your gun. And they have a lot of violence over there, but they don't have gun violence. They don't have people shooting each other up. They have terrorists. That's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. But they're not getting their guns legally. They're coming from another country, and there's this whole other, that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's a society that has a lot of guns. I know in Canada you have the right to own firearms, and you don't have the same problems. No, no. I, I bet you're not allowed to own an AR-15 in Canada. Am I right? As far as I know, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Justin Trudeau. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say this, though. Yeah, your your dad produced a movie called Kansas where Matt Dillon comes up again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I worked on that film, actually. I was 15 years old, and I came mm-hmm. to work on that movie. Okay. So I, I have a lot of set stories. Matt and Andrew McCarthy, who... 
was another matinee idol. So, of course, I got to tell my high school friends, I'm working on a movie with Matt Dillon and Andrew McCarthy. <laughs> and uh, I worked in the wardrobe department. And uh, Matt was more than happy to come back to work with George. He he was always very he seemed to me very gracious and grateful that, mm-hmm. you know, he got his start with George and Jonathan Kaplan. Mm-hmm. And he went on to have a very uh, a great career. I mean, he's played a number of roles. He he played a lot of the bad kids at first, but, you know, he's expanded his his repertoire quite a bit. And uh, every, I time, really love all the every time every time I think does. every time I think of Matt Dillon, I just have that image of him. And there's something about Mary where she comes <laughs> to the door and he's got those <laughs> big teeth. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I think of him in singles as the stoner. Because okay. um, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's so like the antithesis of any other role he ever played. <laughs> but, uh, no, he was great. And uh, he was really cool to me. I mean, he knew I was a 15-year-old kid and I was George's daughter. And I was running around the wardrobe trailers. But um, here's a funny story. This okay. is a funny story. So he and my dad were always really, you know, very pleasant to each other and, and collegiate, collegial. And uh, <laughs> so one day uh, Matt comes into the wardrobe room and they have him change, you know, oh, you got, we need to try on a bunch of stuff. Okay. And I had just started working there in this department. Um, and Matt just strips down in front of me and he's not wearing underwear. <laughs> and I remember I just went, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and one of my bosses was gay. He turned around and put his hand over my mouth when, when no one could see because I was sort of standing behind a clothing rack. Yeah. But he could see that I had just, I had, fi- I, I, well, the first time I saw a man naked was Matt Dillon. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> and I don't think he meant anything by it. That's just what they do when they go in the wardrobe department. They just, you know, a lot of them are not modest and they're, they don't just get it done, you know. <laughs> I don't think it even crossed his mind that I was standing there and that might, you know. I don't think he was doing anything to like he wasn't exposing himself to me, <laughs> and uh, and that's just you know how they what we do. And I worked on many wardrobe departments since then, and I saw many actors disrobe, and some of them are very shy, and they go in the room and they change, and some of them just you know disrobe right there. <laughs> and uh, but I just thought it was really funny that the first time you know I saw a man naked, it was Matt Dillon. So I was like, all right, well that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> But, yes, he did come back on Kansas, and that starred him and Andrew McCarthy, and I, I thought Matt was great in it. I, I thought he did a great job. And uh, and it also introduced this new actress named Leslie Hope, who went on to have a pretty good career in TV. Mm-hmm. And, um, and David Stevens. David Stevens was an Australian director who had done Break of Moran and, and uh, a town called Alice. And he was this kind of unknown director in the United States. But once again, my dad took a chance on him, and he was a really terrific director. It's unfortunate that the company that owned the picture, that financed the picture, decided to go into the distribution business on that film. They loved the film so much, they decided to start their own distribution business, which was a huge mistake because the distributors really have a monopoly on the theaters. And... They didn't quite understand that, and they didn't want to listen to George. So the the film never really got distributed properly. And I think, you know, it was sort of those Brat Pack movie era. Had the movie been distributed properly by one of the major studios, I'm sure it would have had legs. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the cinematography was also done by a guy named um, David Egby. And I don't know if you know who he is, but he did a lot of uh, the cinematography on Mad Max and... um, I think it was Man from Snowy River, Mm -hmm. Um, and he was a wonderful cinematographer. He was also Australian. So it was sort of the beginning of there was this whole movement in, like, the 80s and and early 90s where a ton of Australians were coming to work in the United States, and uh, this was two of them, and I I loved them both. Um, I really enjoyed hanging out with both of them, and and Australians are a lot of fun to be around. They, They work really hard. Mm-hmm. So Mad Max, he was the director of cinematography, and he was the one of the camera operators on Man from Snowy River, and he went on to have you know an amazing career, and he's still a wonderful direct uh, director of cinematography. And unfortunately, David Stevens uh, passed away 
not too long after Kansas, he had a heart problem, and uh, so he didn't really get to, I think had he lived, he probably would have had a really interesting career, because he was a, a very intelligent, sensitive man, and uh, I felt really privileged at 15 years old. Most kids were scooping ice cream, and I was hanging out on a movie set with David Stevens, David Agby, Matt Dillon, Andrew McCarthy, Leslie Hope, <laughs> you know, it wasn't horrible. No. <laughs> what about Night Game? Night Game. Um, Night Game kind of got lost in the shuffle. This same company, TW, mm-hmm. had gotten kind of arrogant. They had too much money. And they they sort of let the inmates run the asylum on that movie. And I think my dad was so fed up with how, how they had handled Kansas and everything else, for the first time in his life, I think he threw up his hands and cried uncle and just said, okay, do whatever you want. Because I think he realized it was a losing battle. So the movie, in my opinion, the script was ten times better than the movie. Okay. And um, unfortunately, I think when the inmates run the asylum and you have too many people, it's like movie by committee. Yes. It it never gets better. But... um, you know, Karen Dark, she was very lovely. Uh, I didn't really get to know Roy Scheider that much, even though I worked in the wardrobe department. Um, and I I was uh, there when he... But I would get kicked out <laughs> when he would come. He was one of those actors who just only wanted to talk to the designer. And um, so mostly I was just... I just enjoyed working on a movie set. But um, here's a a kind of funny story about Kansas. My dad and I, Mm -hmm. when I just asked my father to come, can I come to work on the movie Kansas? Because it was going to shoot in the summertime, and he was going to go to Lawrence, Kansas, which is the town where Kansas University is. I said, can I come to work on the movie? And he said, yeah, sure. And I said, well, what can I do? He said, well, I'm going to make you a gopher, which is what they used to call PAs. Mm -hmm. And I said, why why is it a gopher? And he said, because you go for this and you go for that. Okay. (laughs) And I said, okay. So he stuck me in the production office typing memos and slinging coffee, and I was instantly bored. So I asked him about two days in, hey, Dad, if I can find a better job, can I have it? He said, well, if someone else will hire you, you can, get it, you, can, you can have the job. But if they hire you, they fire you. You don't do the job, that's it. I don't want to hear about it. I said, okay. So I somehow managed to convince the wardrobe department to hire me because really the only thing I thought I knew anything about was washing and ironing clothing. Okay. So I, I, I sort of got them, convinced them to hire me. But then once I realized that I got hired by them, I also realized I had to be the first one on the set. Because wardrobe and the ADs are, and makeup and hair are the first ones to arrive and often the last ones to leave. They have some of the most grueling hours other than Teamsters. But Teamsters get to sleep in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> wardrobe definitely does not. So um, I was of course, 15 years old and living with my father, but he wasn't living in the hotel with all the other actors and the crew members. He had gotten a house about a mile away on a golf course because he was the producer. And so I had to figure out how to get to set every day. And I was beside myself because I couldn't figure out how to get from the house to where the the van picked everybody up at the hotel, and my dad was certainly not going to wake up at 4 a.m. and take me. So I found out in Kansas at the time you could get a provisional license if you had a job to drive to and from your job. And I also found out that the DMV was across the street from the production office of the Department of Motor Vehicles. was across the street from the production office. So I went over there, and I picked up an application, and I filled it all out, and then I stuck it in a stack of papers my dad had to sign, Mm -hmm. thinking he's going to just sign it absentmindedly and hope it like I'd get away with it, which he did. And then I convinced a teamster to give me a car so I could take the driver's test. And I passed, and I got my license. And the next morning, I stole my dad's vehicle, left him a note (laughs) in his Cadillac, and left him a note saying, hey, dad, got a license to drive myself to and from set. Your assistant's picking you up at 8 a.m. Have a great day. (laughs) 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 And my father (laughs) marched on set a few hours later (laughs) with this look on his face. And I stood there like, oh, God, I'm in such trouble. And he said to me, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be mad at you 
or proud of you? <laughs> and I said, um, a little of both. <laughs> and, he, and he just, he said, oh, just don't steal my car anymore. I'll have the Teamsters get you one. <laughs> and he stormed off. <laughs> but he told me that was one of the most proud moments in his life. <laughs> he knew that he was raising a daughter that was going to be able to take care of herself. That is awesome. And and I think that is his greatest memory of Kansas. It's one of my favorite memories on Kansas because it really <laughs> took a little bit of um, of moxie on my part to put up to do something like that. I mean, I was really I was talking to teensters to give me cars. I mean, I was I was wheeling and dealing, and I was 15 years old, so. I think he loved it because he saw that I was, you know, the mirror image, the spitting image of him, but just female. And he told that story over and over and over again because he loved it. And uh, and I'm and I'm grateful because I could never have been that person without his encouragement. You know, he didn't chastise me for doing it. He he was a little bit upset for obvious reasons, but and he. He saw the merit in what I was trying to do. I was trying to be my own independent person. My father was his own independent person, and he wanted his daughters to be the same way. Mm -hmm. He was also executive producer on The Crew. Now, we just recently lost Burt Reynolds. What was his memory? What were the memories about that film? Um, so The Crew, my father had at the time a line of credit to make films, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of insurance-based lines of credit at the time, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, Chase Bank and some of the insurance companies like AIG and AXA Reinsurance were backing film deals like Mike Metavoy's Phoenix Pictures and Peter Hoffman's pic uh, company and my father's company was one of them. And so after a kind of an exhaustive search to find a, a good deal because when the town has, it's the law of supply and demand. If there's too much money, independent money in Hollywood, it's very difficult to make a good deal. Mm -hmm. because the, t the studios don't need the money. So um, the upside was that he had the money. The downside was there was maybe too much of it around. So the truth is, um, I found that movie. I was working for the company, and our head of development had left. She had creative differences with my father, mm -hmm. and... Um, I made a list of all the director and actors who had production companies, and I systematically went and saw all of them that I could see that allowed me to come see them and told them what kind of what, what deal we had and what the terms were and tried to get scripts from them to see if anybody had anything we wanted that the studios was, weren't making. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, we found this script that Barry Sonnenfeld and his partner Barry Josephson that I had discovered with uh, their VP of creative, who is a wonderful executive named Lisa Elzey, who now works uh, for another independent production company and was previously the head of Luc Besson's company. But at the time, she was a, a young thing like me. <laughs> and we kind of cooked up this deal together and then took it to our respective bosses, my father and her, and her berries, as we used to call it, and and then we got them to agree. And then they worked out, they hammered out all the rest of the terms. And as a result, the Berries and George agreed that the two of us should be associate producers. Now, I don't, I'm not going to speak for Lisa's age, but she, I, had, I assume she was around the same age as me. I was 27 years old. Mm -hmm. So when the movie came out, I was 28. So... Again, you can't have a father. Who, he's not a. He was definitely a feminist in his own way. Um, if he was willing to acknowledge our participation, because a lot of other people in Hollywood would not have done that, you know. Mm -hmm. And Barry Finero, who wrote it, who of course was the the creative force behind Golden Girls and a few other television shows, who was a very funny writer, wrote it, and they tapped this guy named Michael Dinner. Barry mm -hmm. Sonnenfeld really liked this guy named Michael Dinner to, yep. to direct it. And Barry was sure that he was going to do a good job and Barry was going to be on set and da-da-da-da-da. So 
you know, we all went to work on it. But unfortunately, the bottom dropped out of the insurance deals, and Mike Metavoy's deal got into trouble, and some of the other deals got into trouble. I think a deal called Destination got into trouble. And Chase Bank had to call in the, the guarantees from the insurance companies, and the insurance companies reneged on the guarantees. So it made all of the deals fall apart. So the crew barely got finished. You know, Chase Bank committed to letting us finish it. But um, it was uh, a really tough time to finish it and then get it distributed because, of course, Hollywood sharks smelled blood in the water, and so they knew that the company was no longer going to cease to exist. They was going to cease to exist and that, you know, the movie wasn't not it wasn't going to be easy to distribute it. So it was very hard to get it done. But Disney did commit to distributing it and they kind of gave it a frankly a half assed, you know, ad campaign and it didn't do very well. But I had a ball on set with Burt Reynolds. I have to say that I enjoyed him immensely. Mm, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people said he was difficult to work with. I thought he was a joy. Um, you know, I was there and, and, uh, he saw me handle a situation and he walked up to me and he's like, you know what, kid, I like you. And I said, well, that's good. Cause I like you too. <laughs> and that was sort of the beginning of our friendship. And he was always very nice to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and Richard Dreyfus is sort of the consummate actor. So at the end of the day, he kind of goes right back to his hotel and, and doesn't socialize as much. Mm-hmm. Um, but Carrie Ann Moss was on that right after The Matrix and Jeremy Piven before Entourage mm-hmm. and Lainey Kazan. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jennifer Tilly. I actually would have a great time hanging out with my two favorite people to hang out with were uh, Jennifer Tilly and Lainey Kazan. We'd sit around uh, our hotel room and have a glass of wine on the weekend and, and just giggle. <laughs> they were great. They were a lot of fun, you know. So, uh, and Lainey had done a movie with my godfather, uh, Abram Polanski, Romance of a Horse Thief, many, many years ago. So, you know, it's funny how in Hollywood everything just comes full circle. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, you, huh? And it, it's just a small world, I guess, yep. you know? And of course, you know, and a lot of this rubbed on to you from your father because I, I'm looking at your IMDb and, you know, you. Wardrobe assistant for JFK, you're uncredited, but that was a pretty huge picture. Yeah, so what happened was the production manager, a guy named Alex Ho, Mm -hmm. uh, who at A. Kitman Ho, Mm -hmm. who had uh, worked with my father years ago and known my father, uh, I was at Tulane at the time, and he was going to, they were going to do a New Orleans crew, so um, I called up. I found out actually from my dad's assistant at the time that he was going to be in New Orleans. I called up and I asked if I could, you know, work on the picture. And they rubber stamped my, (laughs) I got one of those must hires, Mm -hmm. my um, resume to work on JFK. Now, when you're one of the, what they call a a must hire, Mm -hmm. people either treat you one of two ways. They either kiss your A, Mm -hmm. kiss your arse. Because they know you're related to somebody, mm-hmm. or they hate you because how dare you, you know, take this job, and they assume you're unqualified. So some of the people I worked with were more of the latter, and it was a very difficult time for me to work on this. It was the first time I had actually worked on a movie that wasn't my father's movie, mm-hmm. and I got a real dose of being on the other side, and... You know, everyone was always very nice to me on my father's films because he was the producer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then all of a sudden I was left to my own devices and people hated me for being a must hire. And I I sat on the other side of it. And, you know, it was all right. It wasn't, I ended up switching departments and uh, moving into production and working in production and uh, ended up working with a couple of uh production guys, 80s, that I ended up working with on a couple other films afterwards, and we had a great friend. For I'm still friends with them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like my dad always said, nothing's lost. Mm-hmm. I learned something from the situation. Mm-hmm. I did the best I could, and um, I switched departments when it became clear to me that they didn't want me there. <laughs> was Oliver Stone one of those? No, Oliver Stone was 
so busy being Oliver Stone, he okay. didn't even know I existed. Like okay. that crew was enormous. Um, and uh, no, it, it was really just my direct superiors, and um, and it's too bad because I guess I don't think they realized that I was George Leto's daughter. And I, I'm pretty sure if they hear this podcast right now, they're like, oh. Darn it, I should not have done that. I hope they hear <laughs> like it. That's the wrong girl. Yep. Because I really did work hard and try to do my job, you mm-hmm. know? I, I didn't understand why they, you know, had chosen, but I, probably they wanted to hire somebody else. And um, so, you know, I learned also from these experiences that now that I'm a boss, mm-hmm. having done everything from the bottom up, and I, I encourage everybody who wants to be in this business to work from the bottom up. I've done almost everything except handle the camera. I'm a pretty good still photographer, but I, I don't, you know, I don't consider myself in the caliber of camera operators or DPs. I see. Um, I see. But on... I, I've done everything, and I've pulled cable. I've, I've hung lights. Mm-hmm. I've driven trucks. I've done wardrobe. I've done PA work. I've done crowd control. Five one. I've done crowd control. <laughs> I've done just about everything, and I've worked on the production and, and development side in the office, too. And as a result, when I get on a set, I know what everyone's job is, and I know if they're doing it or not. Mm-hmm. I also know how to help. I also see when they need help. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes you a better boss. And it also makes you more I, – I try to be really sympathetic to the people on the bottom. I, I don't like people getting paid badly. My father was the same way. Mm-hmm. He found out that a PA was working 14-hour days and not getting overtime. He would say, uh-uh, that's not how it works on my set. You, you, also, you also have Mighty Morph, Morph Power Rangers. Do you have your own Power Rangers outfit? <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> uh, I, just, I was just a hired gun in the wardrobe department. In fact, the, the designer on Kansas – asked me to come work on that show because she was shorthanded and I was just out of college and I didn't have a job. So I said, yes. And, um, you know, I worked for a short period of time on that show, a few months. And, and then they went into hiatus and I, you know, I went on to do something else, but, um, cause I wasn't going to stay in wardrobe forever. It wasn't my thing. It was just, you know, how I got myself in, in the business and how I started learning the business. Mm-hmm. But from there, I went on to work with my dad and start working in development. And then, you know, we put that deal together for the $250 million line of credit. And then it took us a couple of years to to get, you know, about a year and a half to get the crew together. Mm -hmm. But then we shot the crew and then it came out a year later in 2000. Mm -hmm. And, um, And then I was back in school for a little while. I took a little time off and I went back to NYU and I got my degree. Um not really a degree. It was like a conservatory program for musical theater because, I, again, I sing and I dance. And I, I had decided that maybe I wanted to be on the other side of the camera for a while because mm-hmm. I had also a degree in theater from Tulane and I was an actress. But the thing is, I wrote a script at the time mm-hmm. and um, I got like, uh, I don't know, six inches away from being Julia Roberts' company liked it. Okay. And I was having discussions with them, and and something, some part of me just sort of clicked and said, you know, I think I think I like being a writer better, and I wasn't that keen on being a producer at the time, but I think I like being a writer better. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was the influence of all these writers I grew up with. I don't know, but I decided that I didn't really like auditioning, and I hated the life of you know constantly being rejected as an actor little did i know i was also going to get constantly rejected as a writer (laughs) (laughs) i had changed my mind and moved into writing and i i never looked back i still sing i still dance Mm -hmm. i still occasionally perform but i do it because i love it i don't do it because i'm dying to have a career at it i I always said i want to be rob reiner someday just you know with more hair and maybe a little thinner (laughs) did you and your because rob reiner he wrote he acted he produced he directed Mm -hmm. he he acted he did a little of everything you know and um and he owned his own company at castle rock he was you know a major part of castle rock and and that's what i want to do do you have so maybe someday i'll get to be you know the female mm, rob reiner who's a little thinner with more hair there you go (laughs) (laughs) and i totally don't mean that as an insult to rob reiner (laughs) (laughs) 
Did you, did you and <laughs> More your, about my vanity. <laughs> did you and your dad have any uh, charities that you were involved in that uh, you want to plug on here? Um, you know, my father was a real political wonk. Mm-hmm. And he gave a lot of money to the Democratic Party, mm-hmm. particularly to Barbara Boxer, who was the senator from California, Nancy Pelosi, and his best friend was a congressman from Philadelphia, who later Tom Thomas Foglietta, who later became the American ambassador to Italy. Mm-hmm. My father used to say that politics was a dirty game, and he never wanted to be part of it. But what he understood, I think, having been through the blacklist, is that neither party is perfect, and there's plenty of corruption on both sides. Mm-hmm. But the Democratic Party did a better job of standing up for the worker. The Republicans give lip service to it. Donald Trump gives lip service to it. Mm -hmm. But the Democratic Party supported unions. They supported the ERA. They supported Social Security. They're the party that brought you Medicare and the 40-hour work week. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not that he, he supported animal charities like the ASPCA. He, my dad was a huge animal lover. Mm-hmm. But I think he supported the Democratic Party because he really, truly wanted a fairer society, too. Mm-hmm. He wanted his daughters to grow up in a world where women could be equal, where we got equal pay, mm-hmm. where we could love whoever we choose, where if we have uh, friends or colleagues that happen to be a different color skin, that they would be treated with the same respect as those who are considered white Caucasian males. Mm -hmm. And he was very clear on that. And um, and I'm very clear on that Mm -hmm. as a result of that. And so... His charities basically were animals, which he said he sometimes liked better than people. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> and and hoping that that the left in this country, because we don't really have much of a left, it's really like a center, um, would continue to stand up for the values of the working man and for minorities and for women and for LGBTQ and make the world a fairer place to live. It'll never be fair, mm-hmm. but fairer. You got a web page that uh, you want to plug? Um, I'm. You can find me at andrealito.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you can send me a message there if you need to, mm-hmm. want to. Uh, I don't have any footage up of the documentary yet, but um, I am preparing a trailer right now mm-hmm. that I will put up there. Um, and for people to see mm-hmm. uh, and plug the documentary. I would very much like it if anybody, if I'm going to put it out there, if anybody is related to the blacklist, Hollywood blacklist, or they want to participate in this documentary in some way, they'd like to contact me. Um, help me tell this story about a man who stood up and spoke truth to power by just leading by example. Not because I want people to believe my father is a hero, but because I'd like more people to be like him. You know what? Uh, when this is documentary is finished, I would love to have you back on here. It would and, be my pleasure. Yeah, because I we're 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 closing in on two hours, and <laughs> like, I this is really long. I'm I love I love it. It's not even my longest. <laughs> It's not uh, even my longest, but this has been so fascinating. Yeah, and, well, I, I had a fascinating father. I mm-hmm. have a, fa- a fascinating father. Mm-hmm. He may not be with me now, but he's always my father. Yes. Well, I was going to say, uh, before I let you go, uh, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Sure. Hi, this is Andrea Lito, daughter of producer and agent George Leto, and I am on Gilbert. <laughs> Want to say it again? Sure, go for it. Greg Gilbert's. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, so okay, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Hi, this is Andrea Leto, daughter of George Leto, and I am on Greg Gilbert's Python Paradise 
out of New Brunswick, Canada. Don't forget to tune in. I loved your flub up, though. I got to admit, <laughs> you have a great infectious laugh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just, uh, I got a, I got a brain lapse there for a second. That's okay. I've had some come on here and it take them four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just, uh, we've been talking for two hours. I think I'm getting a little fatigued. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, when the documentary's done, by all means, come back on here. And, uh, if you don't mind, do you mind if I add you on Facebook? Please do. Uh, yeah. I, I, Andrea Lito on Facebook. It says writer, Andrea Lito writer. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my, my professional Facebook. Yep. And um, are, we still re- are we still rolling? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's my uh, professional Facebook is Andrea Lito. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'll, you know, I'll post periodic updates about um, – the doc there too, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm still you know negotiating with financiers on the doc so to complete the financing. So I'm hoping that I will have that done by the end of the year so we can continue uh, to tell this wonderful story. Yeah, you have my permission. Any parts of this uh, interview you want to use, by all means. Thank you. Yeah, this has been fun. I I looked forward to this, and it was everything I was hoping it would be. Oh, thank you so much, and and I appreciate you being so gracious and and um, such a you know a wonderful host. Well, I gotta say too, um, I really see really see how your dad brought you up, you know, and uh, wow, you you turned out really well, and uh, yeah, y- you did, you did, and you're very independent. Um, I I think it's. You, you yourself have a spectacular story. <laughs> well, um, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> nope, you're not. I'm you're just not. getting started. Yep, you're just getting started. Well, you know what? It, it was an honor having you on here. And uh, like I said, uh, keep in touch. And uh, I will, and you do too. Uh, I, I get a little lost when I get overwhelmed with work. So yep. if it's uh, you haven't heard from me, don't take it personally. Just reach out and go ahead and send me an email or, you know, or fire a text off and just say, hey, it's Greg Gilbert, you know, just saying hi. And uh, that usually brings my, my memory back to, oh, I better pay attention to that, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm only doing like 80 things at once. So I feel, like, I feel like I need to clone myself maybe two or three times. If I could do that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's so many of us in that position right now. Yeah, but, you know, that's why we do what we do, because we're driven, so. I will uh, bid you a wonderful evening, and uh, God bless you, and thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, and thank you. And please let me know when you've got a copy of this, just so I have an advanced copy, Mm -hmm. and I will, you know, I will get my lawyer on that, you know, notice so that you and I have an, an understanding, and I will make sure that you are taken care of and credited properly. You know what? I appreciate that, and I am totally honored. Oh, my pleasure, and thank you. No, honestly, this is all very helpful. Yeah. Well, you told a great story. Oh, well, I'm glad. <laughs> thank you. Yes, absolutely. Have well, a great night. You too. You too. Okay, you take bye-bye. Care. Bye-bye.